Hi everyone, Paul here from FamilyWheels.ca with another car review for your growing family. And this week we're in one of the original players in the SUV segment. It's been around since 1985. It's the Nissan Pathfinder. And since then, of course, Nissan has added a whole bunch of different SUVs and crossovers to its lineup. The smaller Rogue, we have the Murano, and then there's the Pathfinder sort of in the middle, and the Armada is the much larger SUV in the company's lineup. This is targeted at younger families who want to have a little bit of extra storage capacity, perhaps use this third row from time to time, but not all the time, and have a boat or a trailer, something that they use on the weekends, and they need a bit of extra towing capacity to get that around. It competes with the Ford Explorer, the Honda Pilot, the Toyota Highlander, so a very competitive segment. And while this has some new changes for 2017, the Pathfinder hasn't had a complete redesign since 2013 at this point. So, despite the fact that we do have a new engine on board, the latest generation of its continuously variable transmission, some improvements to suspension and steering feel, some better safety features, the front end has been cleaned up a little bit. Is it enough to keep the Pathfinder relevant? That's what we're looking at this week here on Family Wheels. So right away here, there are a couple of issues with the Pathfinder that I want to just address immediately. First up, the looks on this thing. There are a lot of excellent looking seven passenger SUVs out there and granted looks are a very subjective thing so you may disagree with me on this but if we look at the Toyota Highlander, the uh, Mazda CX-9 I think is one of the best looking vehicles out there, full stop right now, it's gorgeous. And then on the higher end we've got the Volvo XC90 which has a lot of heads turning these days right now as well. This on the other hand is very bubbly. It kind of looks bloated from the outside. It looks dated even with the refreshed front end on this and those signature Nissan boomerang headlights with LEDs new for 2017. And it's not that Nissan can't make its vehicles look really good. I mean, take a look at the new Murano. It is sleek. It is a nice looking car, but we're not getting that here in the Pathfinder. Step inside, and I'm afraid we're seeing the same thing here. We've got this big bubbly dashboard right up above the front passenger. A lot of the plastics and surfaces just don't feel very high end. It's actually some of the worst wood that I've seen in any vehicle uh, in a modern contemporary vehicle. Really cheapens the overall feel of this car, even though this is the top of the line platinum trim we're testing this week and then of course here for all the buttons with the infotainment system the climate control we've got a really busy zone here in between the two front passenger seats it could be cleaned up a lot more and it's also a very vertical position which again kind of makes this feel a lot more dated than it should the other elephant in the room for the Pathfinder is its transmission. When this latest generation was released in 2013, a continuously variable transmission was brought on board and it generated a lot of issues for a lot of owners, particularly under acceleration. There was a very nasty shutter. Uh, people really complained of it. In fact, there was a class action lawsuit that was won by a group of Nissan Pathfinder owners. Thousands of Pathfinders were affected. But now for 2017, we have this third generation an Xtronic CVT on board and it's one of the smoothest that I've ever come across. We're just about to leave a light here. I'm accelerating. This is where the issues would have occurred and it's a smooth delivery of power. No problem at all. I've been driving this for a few thousand, or a few hundred kilometers now this week and, uh, and under all kinds of circumstances in rush hour traffic on the highway and this latest generation of their CVT is one of the smoother that I've come across in an SUV. This is coupled with the new three and a half liter V six engine that's on board and with 284 horsepower it's confident it doesn't have the kind of lag that you see in some SUVs that are now incorporating turbos in some of their engines it's just a very traditional feeling v6 but we also have some of the best in class fuel economy in the segment Nissan says that you should see between about 9 to 12 liters per 100 kilometers out of this engine. I'm averaging about 11 this week. That's primarily on city roads. It's pretty good for a big seven passenger SUV of this size that can also tow up to 6,000 pounds. Again, that puts it right at the top of its class. The steering feel is a little bit crisper for 2017. The suspension has been stiffened up a little bit too, so it's not going to have quite as much body roll through the corners, which is something that people have complained about in the past with this car. But 
but that said, it's still not exactly an exhilarating drive. The Pathfinder does sit rather lower to the ground than previous generations of this car. There's a plus side to that, which is that on the road, it's going to behave a little bit better. It doesn't have as much road noise. In fact, this is a pretty quiet ride. We average 64 decibels at 100 kilometers an hour using our decibel reader test. The downside to that is that you're not going to be able to do nearly as much off-roading as you would have been able to do in the previous generations of this truck. The original Pathfinder was a real off-road oriented car. It was pretty basic and very much a sort of rigid off-road vehicle based on a truck platform. This feels much more like a car or a minivan than it does an SUV. So you could certainly bounce down a side road, maybe head down to your cottage down a country lane, but for more hardcore off-roading there are certainly better options in the seven passenger SUV segment. One thing I really like about Nissan's all-wheel drive system though, and they've had this in the Pathfinder for a while, is that you can select what mode you want to be in depending on the road conditions. So if the roads are totally dry and you're not worried about slippage, you can go into two-wheel drive, which means that you're basically driving a front-wheel drive car and uh, you're going to save some fuel as a result. You can also go into auto mode, which is constantly monitoring the road conditions. And If you're worried about a bit of slippage, you can leave it there and the car will do the thinking for you. Or if you know that you're on a you know slushy residential street or if you are bouncing down a more rough side road you can pop it into lock mode and below a certain speed this vehicle is going to stay in full-time four-wheel when you get it up to a be I think it's beyond 40 kilometers an hour the vehicle then goes back to the more traditional auto mode where it's going to put power to the wheels that are you know starting to slip on you but if you like the sound of this all-wheel drive system don't let the base price on the Pathfinder fool you yes it's starts at $32,500, but if you're like most Canadians and you want all-wheel drive, you're going to have to bump up to the next trim, which costs an extra $6,000. On the base trim, you're getting three rows of seating, three-zone climate control, you're getting push-button start, keyless entry, not much beyond that though. So for most people with this vehicle, at least they're looking at a vehicle which comes much closer to forty grand when you're all in. Then when you get into higher trims, that's when you start to see things like more creature comforts, leather seating surfaces, moon roofs, that sort of thing. We also have a new suite of safety features on board, including uh, lane keep assist, adaptive cruise control. We have this new 360 degree bird's eye view camera as well. Uh, this, by the way, has a top safety pick rating from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. When we get into the platinum trim that we're in here this week, then we're talking about $48,500 for a price tag. That's seven grand more than the next level down and I don't fully see why you're spending 7,000 more on top of it. Let's talk about some of the features that you're getting. You get bigger wheels, you get an entertainment system in the back seat, you get ventilated front seats, you get forward emergency braking, but honestly that's a lot of money for just a few features and if it were me I'd probably be looking at the SL trim on this vehicle just to save yourself a little bit of dough. One of the things that bothers me about the Pathfinder is that while it's great that they're starting to incorporate these safety features on board their vehicles. If we compare this to the Toyota Highlander for 2017, that company is now putting all of these safety features on all trims that come with all-wheel drive as standard. So it seems like Nissan is kind of playing catch up on that front a little bit. Well, if it just seems a little bit brighter in here than usual when I'm sitting in other cars in the second row, that's because we've got this great big panorama sunroof for the second and third row passengers on the higher level trims of the Pathfinder. We also have a smaller, more traditional sunroof for the front passengers too, but this brings in a lot of extra light for the, for the back portion of this vehicle, and I like it. Other things that you can look for, little Easter eggs in the higher level trims of the Pathfinder here behind the driver's seat, includes this entertainment system, which I already talked about. It comes with only the platinum trim in the Pathfinder. It's a lot of extra money on top of the next trim down. And personally, I find that these systems often wind up breaking down, causing problems. Nissan is not in the entertainment business. Neither is Volvo, in our case, our daily driver. That system has broken down a bunch of times on us. Eventually, we just went, ah, and just wound up using our iPad. It's a far more simple solution, and Apple products are a little bit more reliable than these systems I've found. If you do decide to go into the higher level trims, you also get leather seating surface is back here. We don't have perforated leather seats in the second row, which is great to see for cleaning things up, even though the front seats are perforated. And we have heated second row seats too in the higher level trims of the Pathfinder. 
It is a little bit tighter back here than I expected it to be. My headroom, I'm six foot two, is okay, but it's my legroom that is a little bit of a challenge. Now, it doesn't look bad here from this perspective. It looks like I've got some extra legroom. I've adjusted the driver's seat for a driver who's about six feet tall, but my issue is, check out the angle at which my knees are sitting. I feel like I'm just not able to get comfortable. And also, my feet, uh, don't go underneath the driver's seat as easily as they do in other vehicles. This is a really low sitting driver's seat, so it means that I can't tuck them underneath, and as a result, I'm having a hard time finding a comfortable place to sit here in the second row of the Pathfinder. Now, in terms of car seats, actually pretty good, both front facing and rear facing. They're accommodated really nicely. Roger doesn't kick the front seats when he's front facing and leave all kinds of mud on the front all the time because he's got that little bit of extra leg room. And when you flip the car seat around like we have right now to rear facing, mode we've actually got just a little bit more leg room than even the Toyota Highlander did a couple of weeks ago when we were testing it about nine and a half inches of leg room from the front of the seat cushion up to the glove box and still lots of headroom too that's often the problem when you slide the seats as far forward as they have to be for a rear facing car seat you wind up being pinned in in the headroom department it's pretty good there one thing I really like about the Pathfinder is that Nissan's not trying to sell this as an eight passenger vehicle some of the other competitors out there say oh we can fit three people in the third row we swear we swear we can do it but it's so tight back there there's no way here in the Pathfinder you can only fit two in the back row it's a fairly wide vehicle so you could fit three car seats here in the second row if you wanted to right across the way and another nice thing here about the second row is that it does have a fairly flat uh, floor in the middle position so if you do have to fit a third person here in the middle they're not going to be perched up on one of those little humps which is just so awkward now let's take a look at that second or that third row it's pretty easy to get into with the pull of this handle right here the second seat flips up and slides forward like so and it's actually one of the more spacious third rows that I've come across in our tests. I've put the um, second row as far back as it can go, and you can see that, yeah, sure, I'm pinned in. This is not particularly comfortable for me as a six foot two adult, but for kids, or if you do slide this second row forward just a little bit to give the third row passengers that little bit of extra space, it's actually not too bad. I put this right in line with the Honda Pilot, and certainly far more space back here than I found in the Toyota Highlight. So we've already talked about how much the Pathfinder can tow behind it, but it also has some really impressive cargo capacity on the inside, 1,200 liters of it to be exact, when you've got the third row down. And so that means that you can see here that our standardized test of a stroller, a diaper bag, a soccer ball, a backpack, and a couple of bags of groceries has totally fit without issue off to one side. And it means that you also have room, in this case, for our great big family dog. Comox weighs 80 pounds, and she's still really comfortable back there. So there is lots of room here in the Pathfinder for long road trips with the family. Once you do flip that third row up for extra passengers, your trunk space obviously is going to suffer a lot. You get about 450 liters at that point. But to put that into perspective, that's about the same size as a Mercedes C-Class sedan's trunk. So still not bad. Well, my takeaway for the Pathfinder is that if you're looking for a seven-passenger SUV with some pretty decent fuel economy for a car of this size and also some class-leading towing capacity for a pretty good value, provided you don't go into this platinum trim, which I don't fully see the value of, if you're looking at it for those reasons, I it could be a great choice for you. But if you're looking for a vehicle that's interesting to look at or inspiring to drive, you're probably going to want to keep looking. This is not a particularly exciting car. I'm kind of just meh about the Pathfinder after a week of driving it. One thing I was really pleased to see though is that this continuously variable transmission which has caused such problems for the Pathfinder and really the company took it on the chin with this vehicle too when they had the problems with this transmission a few years ago. It's cleaned itself up here if our tester is any indication. It's a smooth transmission nicely coupled with this new engine. Plenty of power for towing that family boat or trailer around. But I'd like to know what your thoughts are for the Pathfinder. Is it something you're considering Considering, you can leave a comment below. Please subscribe while you're at it and then head over to familywheels.ca where I put together a report card for this vehicle with all the things that we like and some of the things we're not so crazy about. Next time I see you on the program, we're in the new 2017 Subaru Crosstrek, a slightly smaller hatchback with a bit more of an off-road oriented look to it. Let's see how that one stacks up. That's in seven days from now. Until then, have a great week.